We know that the Bible teaches us that in the latter day many will be offended. And you wonder why is that? Is the, is the character or the nature of people going to be different at the end than it is earlier on in, 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 the, in the history of, of the world? And I'm thinking perhaps it would have an effect on it, especially when we're talking about some of our modern ways of communicating with each other. By way of texts and emails and all that, it's so easy. At one time, there was no telephone. You'd have to speak face to face with someone so you get a better feel of the other person. You could talk back and forth. Now it seems the communication things have been broken down in a large way, at least in a different format to where you don't have to put mo a lot of character in it. You can, throw, you can text something and don't have to feel nothing. You can receive the text back with an answer. The, you get no feel out of it. Where before you could read the temperatures. And I'm thinking that some of those things could be reasons that at the end time people will be easier offended than what they were maybe years ago. However, the Bible talks about this. It says even Jesus said that, it, that offenses will come and we cannot prevent it. The problem is, what can we do so that we do not get offended? Now I know that when people get offended, as often they refer to the other person as always the one that has the problem. The one that offends you is the one that has the problem. But I, the way I understand the Bible and my personal experience, it's not the other person that offends me. If I get offended, it's my own problem. That's how I understand it. Now, from a carnal perspective, I could see the other way around would make more sense. But according to the spiritual perspective that we are, we're called to walk in a spiritual realm. We do walk in the spiritual realm. That it is a hard issue that if we have offense. It is not the other person's uh, uh, problem. Even though they can make a serious mistake, should not offend you. They can do something directly against you, should not offend you. Not if you're spiritual. So, what we want to do is we want to take a look at this and see a couple verses of what the Bible says. In Ecclesiastes 10, verse 4, I'm just going to quote this. If the spirit of a ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place. For yielding pacifies great offenses. It sets the groundwork to great offenses. You turn away, you do because it says the spirit of a ruler. In other words, the spirit behind it, and it offends you. It says don't leave because if you leave, you will go and now you'll have a pity party. And that's part of where offenses come from. A pity party is something that in our terms as young children we used to hear that. Pity party. We even had a song that they used to sing in our home that if somebody had a, you know, a little thing that they were offended then we'd sing the little song about pity party. A pity party is, is something that grown-ups don't need. It is something that grown-ups don't do. We do not self-pity. We do not do that. It doesn't yield anything but bad. It will only affect and defile your own heart. Now, in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, I want to get to this. Then said he unto the disciples, this is Jesus, it is impossible but that offenses will come. And then it says, but woe unto him through whom they come. Offenses will come. It says it's not possible that they will not. So if I can say this in the perspective of what we're looking at this, it is impossible for me not to be tempted to get offended once in a while. Now let me say this as a pastor for 35 years. Let me tell you there's rarely a day that goes by that I could not, that I wouldn't be tempted to be offended in something. I'm saying that for a fact. Some people get chances of being offended twice or maybe three times in their life. As a preacher, and I think most preachers would understand this, we have the opportunity almost daily, if not several times a day, to get offended with some things that happen. Even personally, get offended. But we've learned to overcome that. We don't get offended by it. If we would, we wouldn't last long. It would eat up our life. We wouldn't have no, any life to give. It would, it would destroy us. Offense is something we have to learn to overcome and to not let it rule us. And if, if the laity of the body uh, of churches would learn this, churches would have a whole lot less problems. 
And I think every pastor that heard that would say, Amen. So let's get started on this. So sin's offenses will come. The Bible says they will come. And then it says in verse 2, It were better for him that a millstone be hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Do you know the exact meaning of these little ones? The Bible talks about the little ones, but the little ones are God's children. Remember the ones going through the eye of the needle? Remember, you have to be pretty little to go through those. These are talking about God's effective people. I truly believe that. It is not talking about those that have just been born again. No, it is talking about those that have lowered themselves, that are servants of God, that have given their life as surrender, and they walk that surrendered life. To bring offense to someone like that is a very, 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 very difficult thing and a very bad thing to do. Most of those people that have learned that you cannot be offended at that point, and they should not be offended, and that offense is their own problem. But if somebody could get that done and accomplished, it's a sad thing. Now, this is why I find that most pastors and preachers that go through life, they get offended with something that happens in church, and they resign. And those opportunities are readily available to everyone. We could always find reasons to resign and to quit. And it is just by the grace of God that somehow I hung in for 35 years. Praise the Lord for that. Now in verse 3 it says, Take heed to yourselves if, in, if thy brother trespass or infringe against thee. Rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Now there's some people that say we always forgive even if they don't repent. Uh, there's something to this verse that said, if they do repent, you forgive. If they don't repent, now what do you do? Whatever it is, you do not allow yourself to be offended. Notice if thy brother trespass or infringe. And so we're talking about offense. Jesus was talking about offense here in, in, in Luke chapter 17, 1 through 3 now that I read. So it's talking about that very thing. So what happens when someone gets offended? They get trespassed. That means somebody walked on your property. Somebody walked in something that you claim for yourself. And they infringe upon that. That's where offense comes. Something that you thought was yours. Something that you laid claim to. Someone that you, something that you want the honor for. And when somebody infringes upon that, that is where in, uh, offenses begin. So, how do we overcome this? Well, number one, Nothing belongs to us. We deserve death. We deserve hell. I deserve nothing. People have told me already, you deserve a good vacation. No, I deserve nothing. It's all a gift of God. And if I live in that realm that everything is a gift to me, then anything bad that would happen, I will not be offended in it. Because ultimately I deserve it anyways. That's how you overcome offense. Now, people that have problems being offended... They can know they're not living that life. They're living a life of selfishness. They're living a life of pride. They're living a life of a lack of surrender, a lack of servanthood. And as a result, if they get infringed a bone, they're going to fall for it and they're getting offended and then they get bitter and hold on forgiveness in their lives. Um, then in verse 4 says, And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again, to thee, saying, I repent, then thou shalt forgive him. But remember that if he says, I repent, then we forgive. Now, am I saying that if someone doesn't repent, we shouldn't forgive? No, I'm saying that if he says, I forgive, or I repent, then you forgive. That's what I'm saying. The other is, I guess, up to you to interpret. But this is what the Bible says. As a pastor, like I said, I have had daily opportunities to be offended. Uh, I mean, it, it, unless you are a pastor, unless you've lived in the ministry, you just have no concept of what all can come to your doorsteps to try to offend you and to, or even up, upset you or, or to detour you or make you discouraged and so forth. And sometimes these situations are very, very difficult. I have found over the years, though, my response to becoming offended is, when I walk outside the cross of Christ. 
If I take up the cross, it's part of the description of my servanthood. It is. It's the description. It's my job description. And you as a Christian, it's your job description that you are to take up your cross. These, these are crosses that we have to bear. People will say things against you to make you discouraged, to make your hands go down, to make your knees bend. People will do that. But it's Satan is behind the scene. And we cannot take it personal. We cannot walk in the counsel of that ungodliness. We cannot do that. And if you do, you'll be offended. So your brother or sister says maybe a slight remark about you and you feel so offended, it wants to upset you, it wants to raise you up and you'd like to get even with that person. It's because you were trespassed against. And the reason you feel you were trespassed against was you thought it was your property. You thought your reputation that, that you should have is a good reputation. You thought if someone lies against you, I think that's one of the most difficult things for me in my life and in my ministry that I've dealt with if people lie about me. That is a very difficult one because I like to immediately tell the people, that's not true, it's not true, it's not true. But then I'm defending myself. And you know what? Jesus was lied about it as well. And it's just one of those things that goes with the description of the territory. When you're a servant, you're an ultimate servant. And the other thing is if you give your life as a servant, you'll be tested with that as well. How much of a servant are you? You might say like this, well, Lord, I've... This, this person has done this once before and they've spoken bad things. It might be your sister or brother in your family. It might be somebody that simply doesn't like you. And, and you just somehow want to get even with that person. You know what? That person might have been the Judas in your life that Jesus had as a disciple. It, somehow God saw wisdom in bringing a Judas into his life, walking the shores of Galilee, in healing the people, and don't tell me that Judas was not a criticizer. He was one of the disciples, but he was critical about the things that he did for Jesus and that Jesus did. Even the money that he bore, the, the, the Mary that brought the, the uh, perfume and, and poured it on Jesus. He was very, he was very, uh, very critical of that. But he said that he didn't really care. That's not why he was critical. He was critical to be critical to test Jesus, I believe. And part of the refining that God wants in our heart has to go through those processes. It's the wisdom of God. Don't fall for the enemy's tricks. God, in the meantime, if he can purify your heart and give you a heart that is in gold, the way it says in Revelation, purified in gold and silver and precious stone, if you can have that in your heart, this is the overcoming uh, uh, power that we are given. It is we overcome that by allowing it to refine ourselves, not to destroy ourselves. So the next time you go through a time when you would be tempted to be offended, think, will this destroy me or will it purify me? That's the purpose. From a spiritual perspective, which we're called to walk, not as carnal people, not as the world walks, but as spiritual people. We observe and we see spiritual things. Those are opportunities for us to respond and allow God to deal with our heart, to allow to come out what He really wants to have come out and what He wants within us. Um, there was other, uh, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it also says this. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, delivering us from death? Now, when he says he was delivered, that simply meant the cross. When Jesus was delivered, uh, delivered us, that means he died. So that, and then his resurrection was the justification. So Jesus had to die for deliverance from offenses. And that's the same thing we have to do. We take up our cross. We hang our head. It hurts for a while. And we stand up and we go on. This is what, what we're asked to do. Now also in Romans chapter 16, 17, I have several more verses. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. This happens when someone has a problem with getting offended. 
If you're offended, if you've been offended in someone else and so forth, it is often that very thing that was just that I just read right here. It's with the fair speeches and somehow to deceive the hearts of the simple. This is how they try to do to get you all upset and uptight about things. This is a carnal man. That is never the spiritual man because the spiritual man will just not allow himself to go that route. And then in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, one last verse, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That suffering didn't come at the cross. It came all the way through Jesus' life. He suffered and he suffered and he suffered. He suffered scorn. He suffered hurt. He suffered the words that were spoken and yelled out at him. He suffered that. And there is suffering in that. But we overcome by allowing that suffering. Remember what suffering does? It brings obedience. Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. And this is how we learn obedience. This is why we don't give up. We go on and it comes from suffering. Who are we to think that we may not suffer for righteousness sake?